Hello again, Gary Stearman. Welcome to another edition of Prophecy in the News. And once again, as promised, we have with us in studio author Tom Horn. He's written Zenith 2016. Now, we have uh, gotten a pretty good start on discussing this book with him, but today we're really going to get into it. Well, it's always a pleasure to welcome Tom Horn back to Oklahoma City and to Prophecy in the News. But, Tom, the problem is we never have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> There's too much to talk it's about. It's just what happens when you have a great interviewer. Well, thank you, sir. But I, I, I must talk about Zenith 2016. We had talked uh, about uh, the foundation points of your book last time. That is the idea, the fact that occultists really do have a time schedule laid out. And by the way, it's very detailed and is very forceful, but they are expecting things to happen along a certain timeline. We as Christians uh, look at Bible prophecy and we try to uh, examine the times to be, be familiar with the times and the seasons. Our Lord said to watch uh, and we are watching but so are they. And that's what Zenith 2016 is all about. We talked about the great seal uh, of the United States, how it's a prophecy. We talked about the layout of the, of the capital city of the United States, Washington, D.C., which is actually laid out according to a pattern. And I promised on our last broadcast that we would continue that discussion and really get into it. Washington, D.C. may be the only city in the world that's laid out the way it is. I mean, along the lines that it is. Yeah, it and the Vatican. Uh, you have this very uh, predominant scheme where you have this large domed edifice, and it is directly facing from its from its entry point, directly facing a large obelisk. Now, it really is one of the most um, s uh, openly hidden secrets that's known by all occultists and alchemists. Uh, and or people who are researchers and who have studied that kind of symbolism in the past who know that that is a design that originated in ancient Egypt, a dome facing an obelisk. It comes from the myth of Osiris, you know, the story of Osiris's evil brother Set murders him and chops him into 14 pieces and right. throws all the pieces into the Nile. And that was just very central to Egyptian belief. And uh, his uh, sister wife, the queen of magical skills, Isis, she goes up and down the banks of the, of the Nile River, collects 13 of the pieces of Osiris, can't find the 14th piece, which is his missing male organ. But she assembles his body back together, just like we had 13 continents in this country that were assembled together to form one union. And uh, she creates an obelisk, which then becomes magically representative of his male organ, and uh, she magically impregnates herself. Well, Egypt built uh, an entire magical, alchemical uh, belief system around the dome and the obelisk as representing the ever-pregnant belly of Isis and the male organ of the god Osiris. And if you go through the, uh, ancient Egypt, all of their most important religious edifices, including the, the largest uh, religious uh, area that was ever built, the Temple of Amun-Ra at Karnak. You go there, here's the dome, Temple of, of Isis, here's the obelisk of Osiris, and during a festival called Opet, what is it that happens? And I'm, com I'm coming to a point here that's really important. Uh, the Pharaoh, during the festival of Opet, would go inside this ever-pregnant belly of Isis, the dome of Isis. A raising of Osiris ceremony was conducted by the Egyptian magicians, the purpose of which was to draw forth the spirit of Osiris through the base of that obelisk, up through where it would magically emit into the belly over here of Isis. And as Pharaoh standing inside the belly of Isis, he is transmogrified. The spirit of Osiris enters him. He went in the temple as a man. He comes out. He is a god. He is Osiris in flesh. Uh, which is also known as Horus, the son of Osiris. Uh, and this way Egypt knows they have divine representation in the leader of their country. Now fast forward to our day. At the Vatican, you have a dome facing an obelisk. And by the way, that obelisk was taken from the city of Heliopolis, the ancient city of An in the Bible, where it was dedicated to the god Osiris. It is literally one of the obelisks of Osiris 
was removed there and eventually was put into the middle of, uh, of St. Peter Square there. Um, but it, you, now you come to the United States. You have a dome. When the founders were building this country, they actually first called it Rome. They were designing it, if you will, after that same ancient pattern from both Egypt and the Vatican. And now, here's the, the point that's really important. When you talk about occultists and what they believe, and you look at Washington, the dome, and this giant obelisk known as the Washington Monument, the largest of its kind in the world, built by Freemasons in honor of George Washington. It's 6666 six, six, six inches high. It's 666 six, six inches wide along each of, of, the, of the perimeters. It's based on a magic square. I mean, it's just a tremendous amount of occultism. But here's what I was told by a U.S. senator. I was doing his radio show. I won't name his name, but I can verify this. Uh, and he told me on his show, he said, yes, but were you aware that just what they did in Egypt is what they still do in Washington, D.C., that at the inauguration of every United States president, the raising of Osiris ceremony is conducted by these modern Egyptian magicians in the house of the temple, the Herodome, right over by the White House, the headquarters of the Scottish Rite Freemasonry, for the purpose of what, mystically instilling the god Osiris in our U.S. presidents? I can't imagine Ronald Reagan <laughs> would have been interested in that. But they're doing it because they're looking forward to the day when that god is actually going to return and enthrone himself as the leader of this country. I went to the Herodome. I set this up. My wife went with me, Nita, who could verify this. We went inside on a private tour, and I asked the 33rd degree Freemasons, I said, is that true? And they wouldn't answer that question. They answered every other question. They wouldn't say yes or no to whether they actually conduct that ancient Egyptian ceremony in Washington, D.C. at the inauguration of every U.S. president who's standing over there in the Dome of Isis, the Temple Dome, the U.S. Capitol Dome. Anybody can take a tour, walk inside, and look up into her underside belly. What do you see? The apotheosis of George Washington. George Washington becoming a god. This is a very uh, a powerful belief system, but if you couple it with the prophecies on the Great Seal, yes, Gary, 2012, they believe something happened. They believe something may uh, culminate in 2016. They're looking forward to the fulfillment of that prophecy that is on the Great Seal. Henry Wallace, the 33rd Vice President of the United States, wrote extensively how he, Roosevelt, who was responsible for putting the Great Seal on the U.S. dollar bill, they believed that this was a prophecy about the coming of of the God of Freemasonry, and on his arrival, the United States would rise up and become the global leader of the new world order. They believed in those prophecies, and I bet the average American doesn't know they're carrying in their wallet and they're carrying in their purse. More often than they have the Bible on their person, they're carrying a prophecy about the coming of who we would call the Antichrist, because, as you know, Apollo, which is prophesied to come on the Great Seal, is the same spirit identified in the New Testament as the spirit that will fill the Antichrist, the man of sin. Wow. Friends, if you're like me, you're just, you're, your head is spinning and you're saying, I didn't know any of this. Uh, uh, Tom, by the way, that, was, uh, that, uh, that preceding monologue w was probably the best condensation of these facts that I have ever heard in my life. And I'm sitting here and saying, uh, read the book. Uh, the scene is 2016, uh, takes what Tom just says and breaks it down, breaks it out into uh, easily understood informational bits and pieces that uh, you need to know about. Why do you need to know about it? Because our Bible talks about a man of sin who is coming. He's going to be empowered from heaven, the heavens. He's going to be able to uh, call down fire from heaven. He is going to appeal to a strange God whom his fathers knew not, as Daniel puts it. He's going to be, uh, if you will, imbued with power from on high. And, and Tom, a lot of people alive in his day will think that man is talking with God Almighty, but he's not going to be talking with God Almighty. He's going to be communing with a dark spirit and you're saying that dark spirit has its origins way, way back in history, going all the way back to Egypt and maybe before. Well, that's true. The prophecy on the Great Seal, the Novus Ordo Seclorum, that's taken from the Kume Sibyl, uh, who, you know, the Apostle Paul cast a demon out of a, out of a Pythian priestess in the New Testament. The same type of woman, a Pythian, a prophetess of Apollo, known as the Kume Sibyl, 
gave the prophecy that's on the great seal in which she says that at the end of time the god Apollo will return in power and take his throne on earth giving birth to a new golden age. Well in the New Testament Paul said to the Thessalonians that concerning the Antichrist he said he will be the son of perdition and the Greek word there perdition is apalia, Apollo. He'll be the son of Apollo. Um, in, in Revelation 17, the beast yeah. will rise up out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, Apollia, Apollo. And even if you translate it as Apollyon, the Greeks knew the god Apollo also as Apollyon. So again, we have a prophecy. There are very powerful believers in that prophecy. They would not be conducting occult rituals in anticipation of that day if they didn't believe like Henry Wallace and Roosevelt and others have, that this day is coming. And they believe that this, this nation. Now, you know, some people say that um, America might actually be Babylon, as it's discussed, mystical Babylon. And I don't know whether that's right or not. I'm not a scholar in that area. Uh, but I do know that it is easy to believe, when I look at what's been happening in this country for the last couple of decades, the, the path that we have put ourselves on, we are going to play a key role, and we definitely may have a lot to do with the arrival of the Antichrist. Uh, what you're saying is that Washington, D.C. is uh, venerated as a power point. That is a, a focus of, uh, if you will, some spiritual power of some sort, and it has adherence. And you're strongly alluding to the fact that, that out of this will come the Antichrist. Uh, is it too much to infer that the Antichrist will come out of the United States? No, I don't think it's too much to infer. And definitely, again, the, Washington, D.C., uh, is it's like a mystical generator. Uh, you, can go, you can go onto the Library of Congress website and you can read a story called The Most Preferred Plan. It has to do with why was the Capitol designed the way it was. Our own government websites tell this story how they advertise to all these architectural firms. You know something of this architectural firms and how they create designs. Sure. They, they made a competition. Whoever creates the best layout for the city is going to win. They're going to get to build it. And uh, our own Library of Congress website says they were all rejected. Why? Because they said Thomas Jefferson wanted a city based on the old Roman pantheon and dedicated to all pagan gods. That's exactly what they wanted. That's exactly what they built. That's exactly what that generator is doing there in the same way that the ancient Egyptians hoped that it would do. And don't forget that uh, when the Egyptian magicians were challenged, they were able to repeat some of the very same miracles, turning a rod into a snake and some of the other stuff. So these occultists can have power, or at least they believe that they do, and I believe that they have satanic power. And why make the public aware of this knowledge? Because these guys have a plan. But the point is, Jesus has a better one. And the day's coming very soon when you better know what side of the fence you're on. <laughs> How true. You know, you're talking about this uh, going back to ancient Egypt, Isis, Osiris, and, and the Egyptian magicians uh, uh, sort of contesting the power of God through Moses. And I'm thinking, Pharaoh, is he type of the Antichrist? You know, uh, he certainly relies on the same powers uh, that you're talking about here. Fascinating, and by the way, this is stimulating my thoughts as, w as we're moving along in this program. Imagine what you will be thinking when you read through the pages of Zenith 2016. Uh, I guarantee you, you'll be stimulated to a lot of thought of your own. It's going to take you back to your own Bible uh, to validate a lot of the things that you see uh, comparing Bible prophecy with, I guess we could call it an obscene prophecy. There is a group out here of people who are not Christians, basically. They do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or his coming for his body, the church, or his second coming to rule and reign over the nations. They don't believe in any of that. They've got a separate belief system, and they have their own timetable. And that's what this book is all about. This is exciting stuff. Well, it is, but we also know that we have a more sure word of prophecy. Amen. See, they have prophecy. We have a more sure word of prophecy. But one thing both sides know is that it's like two trains are racing toward each other. And there is a moment in time in which that clash between supernaturalism, both good and evil, 
is going to occur. And you know, recent polls, isn't it interesting that recent polls are showing right now that 33% of Americans, not churchgoers, mm -hmm. 33% of Americans believe that we may be living in the end times. The world has a sense right now that we are moving very rapidly, Gary, towards a moment, a point in time. Yes. And that this entire thing could explode in literal apocalyptic flames. Well, what does that say if you're a rapture believer, for instance? I mean, we, we are living in imminent possibilities right now, aren't we? Well, we believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He could come before Tom and I are finished talking here today. But more than that, we see the stage being set in, in the most remarkable way now. It's being set in Israel, it's being set in the Middle East, being set in the United States, being set in the church, the body of Christ. There is a quickening of understanding among those followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, like you and like me, who uh, something in our spirit is telling us that we don't have very long. We, we had better uh, apprise ourselves of uh, what we need to know in, in order to be uh, outfitted and, and, and equipped for these last days. And I think Tom and other writers like him is helping us to have that sensitivity, that awareness that we need to have right now. I think you feel led to produce these books precisely for that reason. Well, that's absolutely right. And sometimes we use things as an opportunity, the, the whole prophecy of the popes. And uh, we should say that uh, the people who order this book from you, Zenith 2016 and the, and the new movie, I guess, that we'll talk about in a moment, The Last yes. Pope, uh, they, they're going to get those other two large investigations absolutely free. The Petrus Romanus, the final pope is here, and then the one that followed that, Exo Vaticana, which literally took me and Chris Putnam's to, <laughs> to other worlds, if you will. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we find things we didn't expect we were going to. We'll just feel compelled to, to start an investigation, and we let the Lord take us there. And sometimes it's only after the fact that we kind of figure out why he took us there and why it was important, and we're just thankful that uh, we silly men, you know, were, were willing enough, really, to follow his lead. Now, there's so much more we could talk about in Zenith 2016, but I want to shift gears here and, and talk about some work that uh, Tom Horn and Chris Putnam have been doing. And, of course, they've both been uh, right here in the Prophecy in the News studio in the past to kind of fill you in on what they were doing. Uh, the, the latest... Uh, uh, incredibly watchable production is this DVD called The Last Pope, produced by WorldNet Daily Films, and the production values on this are incredible. This DVD is a, uh, a, it's a, a, a mystery, which you get to participate in from beginning to end, the prophecy of the popes. It is a travelogue that takes you to the places where uh, St. Malachi actually walked, and, and you get to see historic locations. Uh, you, you get to hear men speak uh, in, I think, with, with real passion and emotion in their voices. Uh, this, this film takes you all over the world, it takes you to Ireland, it takes you across the sea, it takes you uh, into the lands being uh, discussed historically, and it makes real the prophecy of the popes. You may have read about it uh, in print, but it's another thing to see it in a movie. Right, I mean, and, and, it's, and it's also relevant because whatever you make of the prophecy of the popes, it is allegedly approximately 900 years old, and it just came to its final line. Yeah. So it's historically important, if for no other reason than that. And then if you add to it the possibility that it also may be a prophecy that has had some uncanny fulfillments in it, you start asking questions about, well, was it inspired? Is it being followed by a roadmap? It just opens these kind of questions up. And one of the things that's real interesting is some in the media when our, our book, uh, Petrus Romanus, The Final Pope, is here, when that book was published, some of the media were saying, well, Catholics, especially educated Catholics, uh, they don't believe in the prophecy of the popes, and there's nobody in the Vatican, there's nobody among the cardinals. What that film does, it actually approaches it kind of journalistically, objectively. It does feature me and Chris Putnam, but it features a lot of other people, experts, historians. They go all the way to the Vatican, they talk to a Vatican yeah. historian, then they go from there to Ireland, they talk to church oh, yeah. leaders over there, and they have the church there where Malachi uh, was uh, a, a bishop, and so they talk to all these experts, and what really comes down is that you discover that there are a lot of highly placed authorities who actually really do believe that there is something to this prophecy. Well, 
if there is, then where does that put Pope Francis, right? Where does that yeah. put number 112, the final line the in this final 900 line. year old it, prophecy? Let yeah. me interrupt you, but, uh, because I'd like to take you to one point in particular, and that is uh, the previous Pope, Benedict, uh, actually made history by resigning the papacy. It just doesn't happen that a pope resigns. Not only that, he resigned at a particular time. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, you know, we, we really took and put our neck out there on the chopping block because Chris Putnam and I did something. It took a lot of bravery, but based on a lot of research, we predicted that Pope Benedict would likely step down, and our date we set, we thought it would be around April of 2012. Right. Now, no pope had resigned in 600 years. Hadn't happened in modern history. Yeah. It wasn't likely to happen. Popes don't resign because they get sick. They die in office, right? Right. Uh, but we made that prediction. Of course, if, if people go back and watch the archive shows or read these free books they're going to get from you, they'll find out there was a, Jesuit Belg a Belgian uh, Jesuit by the name of René Thibault who also had predicted 61 years in advance that Gloria Olive, right, Pope Benedict, would step down, he thought, in April 2012. So that was part of why we set that date. Well, 2012 came and went. The month passed, and now we're into 2013. And, and everybody thought you had blown it. Yeah, everybody thought we had blown it. Now, it's interesting <laughs> because you had Steve Quayle on your show yeah. recently. But uh, about 10 days before the Pope resigned, I was on Hagman and Hagman with Steve Quayle, and I said, the resignation of Benedict is eminent. Well, when he resigned in February, just 10 or 12 days later, my phone was ringing off the hook. In fact, I had people from Rome. I had the media from over there wanting to know who our insider at the Vatican was. <laughs> and I told Chris Putnam, I said, if we told him it was the Holy Spirit, that really confused him, right? <laughs> but, um, but we've So he resigned like we said he would, but then we learned something because a journalist for the New York Times interviewed a spokesman for the El Observatore Romano, which is the Vatican-owned media outlet, and he admitted that the Pope, Benedict, had actually officially stepped down at the end of March, the beginning of April, 2012. He made it official internally. Only a handful of the members of the Vatican government, the Curia, were aware of it, and they started remodeling a building that they thought he might live in, and they started making plans. He was going to make this public. He intentionally waited till February to make it public, but he actually resigned at the same time that we thought he would. And I'll say it again, <clears throat> something really did happen in 2012. After all the hype, the hoopla, people, you know, said, oh, 2012's come and gone, nothing happened. Something did happen. There has been a shift of sorts, uh, if you will, a paradigm shift moving into 2013, 14, 15. I think we're going into some fascinating times right now, uh, Tom, and I believe you're on the trail of that. Well, and there's also some strange things about this new pope. We, w we did a show with you a year before the pope resigned, and I said on that show with you that the new pope would not need to be named Peter. You might even make the argument wh against why he shouldn't be named Peter. Rene Thibault did, uh, because all of the mottos in the prophecy are symbolic. In other words, they don't give you the name. Benedict wasn't born Gloria Olive. It tells you something about that papacy. And so that's what we thought. We thought Rene Thibault was correct, that it would tell us something about the papacy. Well, now you have a guy who's a Jesuit who is actually under oath to accomplish exactly what Rene Thibault said he would in, uh, uh, in prioritizing Romanism and drawing the world back into Romanism. And look at the popularity of this pope. He's on oh, the yes. front page of Time magazine. Uh, they're, call, they're now, because of his resistance to Obama's plan to drop bombs in Syria, they're calling him an international man of peace. There's some ominous stuff that's kind of developing around him. Then add to the fact that he took as his namesake Francis of Assisi, a guy whose original name was uh, Pietro de Bernardone, who would, whose name would literally mean Peter the Roman, which is the final line right out of the prophecy of the popes. It is. But Francis of Assisi was also a mystic. And Francis of Assisi believed a final pope would come who he said would be a deceiver. He would deceive the world. He'll charm the world. But he said he is a destroyer and not a true pastor. Why would you... Bergoglio is a really smart guy as a Jesuit. He's got degrees in history. He knows that Francis of Assisi gave that prophecy. He also knows he's the final line of the prophecy. Why would you name yourself after somebody who said the final pope is going to be a deceiver and a destroyer whose name can mean Peter the Roman? 
there's some just really <laughs> shocking stuff, right? Oh, yeah, including his latest statement that uh, you don't really have to believe in God to go to heaven. Atheists don't. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we have to. <laughs> Well, I certainly do, and I, I believe in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and I know Tom does, and, and, and we are followers of Jesus proudly. Uh, we are loyal followers of his, and, and we believe pr Bible prophecy concerning his return for his people and his return to rule and reign over the nations. And I just want to say that right up front and get that out of the <laughs> That's just good preaching right there, Gary. <laughs> I have to tell you, Tom, I wish we had another half hour, but <clears throat> Tom's book is Zenith 2016. We have barely scratched the surface on this book, and we're presenting it to you uh, along with this wonderfully produced uh, uh, film. It, it's called The Last Pope, and, and you'll just, I think you'll watch it again and again. I've watched it once, and part of the second time, I'm planning on watching it again very soon, but for $39.95, you get these two items and absolutely free the previous two books by Tom and by Chris Putnam. And one, of course, is Petrus Romanus, which you heard Tom talking about a minute ago, Exo Vaticana. Here we have four items that would be about an $80 value. We're calling it the Zenith 2016 package, yours for $39.95 plus shipping and handling when you call the 800 number on your screen. These two items plus the two free books, and by the way, these are wonderful books, uh, extremely valuable. You've got to have them in your library, all four items, $39.95 instead of the $80 that it would cost you. You've got the 800 number on your screen. Call and ask for the Zenith 2016 package. Let me say that again, the Zenith 2016 package. They'll know what you're asking for. You will not regret the decision to purchase this package because the information is far beyond uh, anything that I can relate to you in other than about a three-hour program. And I wish we had a three-hour program, Tom. Well, and I would only add also to what you said about the last pope. Uh, it, it, when uh, Joseph Farah from World Net Daily, when he approached us about whether we would be part of that film, we agreed to do it. But I was astonished at how well it is made. It yes. is a world-class, first-class production on a par with the best of filmmaking. Uh, and you'll, when you get it and you watch it, you'll learn why World Net Daily has been the number one faith film holder for something like two years in a row because they didn't cut any quarters, uh, any corners on the production level of that documentary. Well, Tom, <clears throat> you've just blown me away today, as usual. I love to talk with you. We have so much to talk about and so little time. You know, Jesus is coming soon. Everything says it. Everything shouts it from the rooftops. We don't have much time. We've got to spread the word. Tom is doing it. I'm doing it. Prophecy in the News is uh, dedicated to that premise. Tom, we've got to talk again. Okay, Gary. Great to be it's with you again. It's been great. God bless you and your work, and God bless you all out there. And remember, keep looking up. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported program made possible by our many friends around the world. Be sure you tune in every day for breaking news and our daily prophetic news updates at prophecyinthenews.com or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash prophecyinthenews.